Welcome to the John D. Odegaard School of Aerospace Sciences to our 2023 Hall of Fame uh, induction ceremony. I do want to recognize some of the special guests that we have in town. So last night we had our Alumni Achievement Awards, uh, formerly known as the Sioux Awards. We do have, I believe, two current Sioux Award winners in the room. So we have Miss Diane Odegaard and Karen Nyberg is also with us, who is helping with the uh, capital campaign this year that is kicking off this afternoon at 1.30. And so uh, welcome to them. We also have some former Hall of Fame inductees in the room with us. So back in the corner of the room, we have the, the loud bunch back there, the 85 flying team. So we have Larry Martin, who's the chairman of the board for the UND Aerospace Foundation board. So Larry and his brother, Roger, are both members of our Hall of Fame. And then Jim Bunky is also with us. And everyone knows Jim. <laughs> so we are here to honor two of the John Yodegaard School of Aerospace Studies Sciences uh, alumni or people associated with our college and university uh, into our Hall of Fame this year. So we have uh, Bruce Smith, a former dean, and we have Pat Halligan, and you'll hear a lot more about them uh, as we honor them individually. So welcome to all the family and friends of each of them. Uh, I would like to also introduce the, we have the four dean's wives are all here. And so, so my wife, Heather, is with us, Bruce's wife. Uh, and, uh, oh, when, well, yeah, so with the, anyway, we have them all here. So um, Paul Linseth in the back of the room. So Paul and Glenda are here. So thank you, Paul. We'll do lunch, and then uh, once we're close, we'll start honoring our inductees. So thank you. So we're going to proceed with the ceremony right now. So I'm going to hand it over to my to our wonderful staff. And so Jonathan Gerke is going to kick off the first one. Yep. Thanks, Bob. <clears throat> well, uh, first of all, I know I, I think I say this every time I get up and, and have the mic and you can't stop me because I have the mic. So um, but it's I just can't tell you how special this UND Aerospace family is. I feel so fortunate to be a part of it. Um, and so, so um, thank you for that. It's an honor for me to be here today and to play a small role in this ceremony by introducing our friend Pat Halligan. Pat was born and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He attended UND from 1973 to 1976, graduating with a bachelor's in aviation. Following his time at UND, he used his flight instructor ratings to teach flying lessons to young aspiring aviators at the University of Minnesota flight facility at the Anoka Airport north of, on the north side of Minneapolis. Yes, he, he admits he was working for the enemy, <laughs> but he was living at home. So while flight instructing, Pat was selected for pilot training slot for the Minnesota National Air Guard. Uh, he attended undergraduate pilot training at Reese Air Force Base in Lubbock, Texas, where he flew the T-37 and T-38 and his first experience flying supersonic was in the T-38. He went on to fly the C-130 for the Minnesota National uh, Air National Guard from 1980 to 1986. In 1980, he was hired by Republic Airlines as a flight engineer on the Boeing 727, which started a long successful career as an airline pilot. <coughs> Following that first post, he went on to fly the Cove Air 580 as a first officer and captain, the DC-9 as a first officer and captain, and ultimately as a captain on the Airbus A320. Now, while he was hired by Republic, Republic was bought and merged with Northwest Airlines in 1986, and then Northwest Airlines and Delta Airlines merged in 2008. Pat was there through all of it, and he retired as a Delta Airlines captain in 2012 after 32 years on the job. The end, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> you see, while <clears throat> all this is impressive in its own right, I want to go back to a part of Pat's story that I didn't tell you in the beginning. You see, Pat had an uncle, Jerry Farrell, who was an airline pilot. And for Pat's high school graduation, Uncle Jerry paid for Pat's solo license, which was eight hours of flight time. 
And uh, at UND, what, what his uncle gave him, uh, a gift to pursue your education, we call that a scholarship. So Uncle Jerry gave Pat a gift of scholarship. I'll submit to you that I believe this gift, this act of someone else investing in him, in his career, his education, left an indelible mark on him because Pat has not only been an airline pilot, but he's selflessly served organizations that lift up our industry. Now, Pat, I know you said you weren't going to say all these things, but I'm going to do it for you. So <laughs> Pat was EAA Chapter 25 president from 2000 to 2003 and remains on the board of directors today. He's known as the banquet chairman for life. In fact, <laughs> in a couple weeks, there's another banquet happening for the chapter. Um, he was also on the board of directors for the Minnesota Aviation Hall of Fame from 2013 to 19. And he's currently on the board of directors of the Minnesota Pilots Association, which he joined in 2019. But there's more. At each of these organizations, his passion has been to push these groups to partner with donors to do something special, to give opportunities to young people who might have not had as much help as they had otherwise. Pat had a passion for starting scholarships. Two, in fact, the Ken Dahlberg Scholarship and the Aircraft Marine and, and Insurance Scholarship are specifically for UND students, started through EAA Chapter 25. At three, with the Minnesota Aviation Hall of Fame and with the Minnesota Pilots Association, there's been two pilot scholarships and two mechanic scholarships, and those most recent recipients were, in fact, UND grads, the, the pilot ones. <clears throat> I'll admit, I didn't do the math, but I know that over the last decade, tens of thousands of dollars in scholarships have been awarded to young people to pursue their dream of aviation because of Pat's diligence, passion, and desire to pay forward the gift given to him so many years ago. He's a true professional, a passionate aviator with an infectious love for flying. Just recently, Pat, in fact, was awarded the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award for 50 continuous years of safe flying. Congratulations to that, Pat. So many times when I get the chance to visit with Pat, I'll ask him how he's doing. <clears throat> he still says, I got to go flying today. <laughs> he's owned a 172, a 182, a Baron. He's building his own airplane, uh, a, a wooden fabric airplane called a pit and pole. And he's uh, the proud owner of a new Cessna 206 on amphibious floats, which we just talked about a little bit ago. Um, and a quick story on the 206, I, I happened to talk to Pat uh, before he bought this airplane. And uh, when, he, when he made the decision, one of the first things he said to me was, I can't wait for my grandkids to see this airplane. So I think for Pat, <clears throat> it all comes back to family and friends and sharing his love of flying with them. And so Pat, for, thank you for all that you do for your airline career, for your tireless dedication <clears throat> to supporting students through the gift of scholarships and for your unwavering passion and love for the University of North Dakota and the Odegaard School. It's my privilege and honor to be the first to welcome you as a 2023 inductee to the UND Aerospace Hall of Fame. Wow, saying all those nice things. I thought you were talking about Jim Bunky for a minute there. <laughs> <laughs> so Dick and Mary would go to the state fair every year, and Dick would say to Mary, Mary, I'd like to go for a ride in that helicopter. And Mary would say, Dick, I know you do, but that helicopter ride costs $50, and $50 is $50. Well, COVID came and COVID went, and they were back at the state fair again this year. Dick said, Mary, I'm getting older. I'd like to go for a helicopter ride before I die. She said, Dick, that helicopter ride costs $50, and $50 is $50. Well, the helicopter pilot heard the two of them talking. He walked over and he said to them, I tell you what, I'll give you a helicopter ride, providing you don't say a single word, you don't talk, you don't laugh, you don't scream, nothing. If you do that, it's free. If you make a noise, it's 50 bucks. They looked at each other and said, sure, let's go. So the helicopter pilot jumped in the left seat, Dick jumped in the right seat, Mary got in the back, Helicopter pilot took off, put, pulled the nose up, pushed it down, went left and right. A couple more circles came in and landed. He said, Dick, I can't believe it. You, you didn't say a word. 
He said, well, Helen almost said something when Mary fell out. <laughs> the pilot said, you didn't say something when Mary fell out? He said, no, because 50 bucks is 50 bucks. <laughs> I hope you bear with me as I tell a couple stories and thank a few people. I'd, I'd like to thank two men who are no longer with us, but who have played a responsible, are responsible for me being up here today, John Odegaard and my dad. They had a few things in common, and one of what, what those was they both wanted me to fly. Because of them, fly I did. Unfortunately, neither got to see the final fruits of their labor, as both of them passed away at the same age of 57. Way too young. I would be remiss if I didn't also thank people like George Hammond, Don Smith, Earl Strendon, and John's wingman, TC, Tom Clifford. Those men did their jobs with a passion for UND, and more importantly, for the students, not for themselves. Because of them, and many others, UND is home to a world-class aviation program. I'd also like to thank my Uncle Jerry Farrell, who Jonathan talked about. As Jonathan said, uh, Jerry paid for my solo license, uh, $12 an hour for the Cessna 150, $5 for the instructor. $17 an hour, it cost him 136 bucks for me to solo. <laughs> so, and Jerry was a Convair 580 captain when I was in college up here. He'd call ahead of time. I hope the FAA isn't in the, hang, in, the, in the room. He'd call me up, I'd go out to the airport and meet him. He'd take me behind the ticket counter, through operations, and out to the airplane. I'd ride his jump seat between, mini, or between Grand Forks and Devil's Lake and back. So, anyhow. <laughs> And then I was fortunate to be, to be hired by Republic Airlines and I actually flew with my uncle. I can honestly say I left home as a teenager and I returned home a young man because of UND. Let me give you a couple examples of things I learned at UND. And I'm not talking about who had the best two for one drink specials either. <laughs> studying, I learned to manage my time to start studying for a test days before, not the night before. That carried over to my airline career. When I had a check ride coming up, I would start studying weeks before. My speech class at UND helped me during my interviews, and even today, as I stand here in front of you. If I hadn't taken that class, can you imagine what this talk would look like? My <laughs> knees would be shaken, I'd be rocking, and this paper would be shaken. <laughs> Speaking of UND classes, I thought I did okay, okay grade-wise, but that all changed 25 years after I graduated. It's coming, Colleen. The names in the following story have not been changed, but some of the facts have because they say, don't let the facts ruin a good story. <laughs> the phone rang at our house. I answered it. It was my daughter, Colleen. She's sitting right over here with a dark dress on and long blonde hair. She was a sophomore up here at UND. She was in the DG house. Now, I know most of you think DG stands for Delta Gamma. It stands for Dear God. <laughs> <laughs> Colleen was crying. She said she'd got an A- in her microbiology class, and now she wouldn't graduate with a 4.0. I said, 4.0 is not a big deal. I had a 4.0 when I graduated. She said, no, Dad, I saw your transcripts from the Cedar Chest. You had a 1.0 four years in a row. <laughs> I said, do the math. Four times one is four. <laughs> she said, it's not cumulative, Dad. Then she said, and you didn't have a 29 on your ACT test like you put down on your application to UND. I said, I had a 14 the first time I took it and a 15 the second time, but it's 29. <laughs> She said, geez, Dad, it's not cumulative. <laughs> now we're both crying. <laughs> After I graduated from UND, like Jonathan said, I was teaching flying lessons for the University of Minnesota, and I got picked by the Air National Guard uh, to, to go to pilot training at uh, Reese Air Force Base in Lubbock, Texas. Here's what my solo endorsement said. On the sixth day of April, 1979, Lieutenant Patrick Halligan did, with reckless abandon and complete disregard for Newtonian's physics, slip the surly bonds at a T-37 and with a dazzling display of aerial proficiency, solo a jet. With aforementioned aircraft strapped securely to his tightly clinched gluteus maximus, he defied gravity, cheated certain death, and leapt into the wild blue in a glorious combination of man and machine. Signed by my squadron commander. Okay, so I'm not up here for my grades at UND, even though I did uh, make the dean's list a couple of times, truth be known, or my military career, or my 32 years of uneventful flying at the airlines. I must be up here for scholarships. Actually, OPM scholarships, other people's money. Uh, my fellow classmate in Sandy Berg, uh, who nominated me, uh, must have mentioned scholarships. I had planned to thank him today, but he was unable to make it. 
Uh, he had a medical uh, issue yesterday. He's going to be okay. I, mu I must admit, I never planned on scholarships. It was more or less an accident. The Minnesota Aviation Hall of Fame was passing out a book one evening as I left the banquet. It was the book of the Ken Dahlberg story. Ken Dahlberg was a World War II ace, and he started the company called Miracle Ear. Um, and as a matter of fact, I have copies of this book for everybody tonight or today as you leave the, uh, the banquet. You get, a, you get a copy of the book. I talked to the uh, people that put the book out. They're going to give you a free one. So anyhow, I contacted the estate and see if they wanted to do a matching scholarship with my EAA chapter for $500. The reply came back that Mrs. Dahlberg liked the idea, but she wanted to do $1,000 each. Well, I hadn't even asked my board for $500, let alone asked them for $1,000. But I must have learned this from JDO. I said yes. <laughs> Just like John, ask for something first, then work out the details later. <laughs> And as Jonathan said, the scholarship has been at UND now for 11 years, and it's now a $3,000 scholarship. I started two more at the, my EA chapter, three after getting on the Minnesota Aviation Hall of Fame, and four with the Minnesota Pilot Association. Jonathan told you all about that. And all of them are using other people's money. Uh, the one thing I want you to take away from this, though, is those scholarships are not being funded by me, but rather by other generous folks. I'm just the facilitator. You ever think about starting a scholarship by yourself or with someone else? Talk to Jonathan Gierke here at UND. We all know how, ex how expensive flying lessons are, and scholarships are a great way to help them. A scholarship recipient will say thank you. The scholarship recipient's parents will say thank you and tell you how grateful they are for the monetary help. These young scholarship recipients are our future. We can help them one scholarship at a time. I want to thank my friends especially my UND friends, in particular my college roommate, Dave Miedema. <laughs> you all know Dave. Dave worked for the Alumni Association most of his adult life. We've been best friends for 50 years almost to the day. And our wives, they've known each other even longer. They, they met at kindergarten here in Grand Forks, North Dakota. They went to grade school and high school together. I think they had their eye on us as soon as we stepped foot on <laughs> campus, Dave. <laughs> I want to thank my relatives for joining me today, too, to watch me receive what I consider an unbelievable award. I'm truly honored to be inducted into the UND's Aviation Hall of Fame. I told myself I wouldn't get emotional. <laughs> I want to thank my daughter, Colleen, my son, Kevin, who's a UMD graduate, go dogs, <laughs> for all the joy they've brought into our lives. And to them and their spouses, Josh and Tanya, for giving my wife and I four beautiful grandsons. And last but certainly not least, I want to thank my wife, Sandy, for 43 years. I love you. And to our other inductee today, Mr. Bruce Smith. After John passed away, there were some awfully big shoes to fill. I think they were size 12s. <laughs> uh, well, the aviation school could not have chosen a finer person to be the second dean of the aerospace school. Thank you, Bruce, and congratulations. In closing, I want you to know I could not have picked a better place to go to college in Grand Forks and a better school than UND. I will remember this day and treasure this award the rest of my life. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless UND. Congratulations, Pat. And I think we can all see why this is definitely one of our most favorite days in the Odegaard School. Uh, and I do want to recognize Paul Linza for letting and supporting this concept back when we celebrated our 50th anniversary in 2018. And I know we're going to continue uh, to honor these amazing alum uh, of the program. So oddly enough, our next nominee, uh, Bruce Smith and I, began our professional careers at the Odegaard School at the same time. Well, now he may have been hired to lead the entire college in 2000, and I was simply hired into my first salaried position as a lead flight instructor uh, out at the airport. And I'm not sure if it was his football physique or his breadth of military and industry experience that intimidated many of us newer employees of the Odegaard School, 
but you can imagine my shock and nervousness when I showed up at the first Odegaard Open at Ray Richards Golf Course in the summer of 2000 and learned that I was going to be put on the foursome with the new dean. <laughs> now mind you, I am not a golfer. I've advised many students over the years to take this course because of this experience uh, this day. I learned two things pretty quickly about Bruce that morning. One, he loves golf and takes it very seriously. And two, he's a little competitive. <laughs> I also knew that I was not going to add value to the team, and I'm thankful that we got to use one of my hits that day, and it may have been because the ladies' tees were like a good 100, 150 yards in front of the men's tees, thank God. Uh, but uh, that's about all I contributed during the golf tournament. It wasn't that game that I remember clearly, more clearly of that day. It was the conversations that I overheard maybe eavesdropped on in the clubhouse following the tournament. It was a conversation between Bruce, Paul Linseth, and Doug Marshall. And they were talking about what this new Masters of Science in Aviation would look like at the Odegaard School and how they could start this program uh, in the coming year. At the time, I was completing my MBA through the College of Business, so of course I was a little jealous that I was not going to be able to be a part of that program at that time. But I also knew that we were in absolutely great hands with Dr. Smith to lead us forward in the second chapter of the Odegaard School. <clears throat> Now, since my history with the Odegaard School truly began with Dean Smith's uh, at the helm, I wanted to reach out to a number of individuals who held leadership reigns both before Bruce's arrival and after to learn more about his leadership style and what uh, we learned during that time. Now, I will say I did a little mini qualitative research project throughout this, and one prevalent theme emerged. And it was kind of a theme that, that Pat just mentioned as well, that Bruce was absolutely the right fit for the college at the right time. So growing up in St. Louis Park, Minnesota, it was the game of football that brought a young 17-year-old Bruce Smith to the University of North Dakota on a full ride scholarship. He was a starring offensive lineman for the university, but during his time at UND, Bruce was a true student athlete. He took full advantage of everything the university had to offer, double majoring in mathematics and education and joining the Air Force ROTC detachment. It was actually through the ROTC program uh, that John Odegaard has secured flight training for those commissioning to get their private pilot certificates. So Bruce began his flying career at UND in some of the original aircraft uh, of the program and obtained his private pilot in an impressive 36 hours. So when I first spoke to Terry Clark, Director of Fiscal Affairs that oversaw both the Odegaard School and the UND Aerospace Foundation during Bruce's reign, she was quick to compliment Bruce's many skills that she attributed to his time as being a star football player at the university. She recognized that Bruce remained very strong on offense. He grew both the Odegaard School and the Aerospace Foundation. In fact, when he began in the year 2000, we roughly had a, an annual budget of about $24 million, which is impressive in and of its own right. But during Bruce's reign, that revenue stream annually grew to over $90 million annually and sometimes even over $100 million. So that is a pretty good offensive strategy. But it wasn't just offense, Bruce was also very good on defense, sometimes having to defend the program both internally to the university as well as externally to other stakeholders. She also mentioned that he was one heck of a referee. So if he came in and parties weren't necessarily agreeing uh, and he had to uh, throw a flag or make a call, uh, he would listen, but he would make a decision and that decision was well respected for the entire organization because they knew he had their interest at heart. <clears throat> and she even mentioned that he was a great cheerleader. Uh, and of course, uh, the entire organization uh, was benefited by that unprecedented growth we saw in his leadership. So after graduation, Bruce commissioned into the United States Air Force and began his military career as an accomplished instructor pilot, researcher studying the impact of new flight training simulation, and even taught psychology at the U.S. Air Force Academy. After completing his service, Bruce continued to use these skills and knowledge he acquired during his time uh, to further research and study simulation in the training environment. It was also during this time that he pursued a doctorate in instructional design and development at Florida State University. Throughout his professional career, Bruce held leadership positions at CAE Link, Hughes Raytheon Training, and was a director of uh, training at Delta Airlines. 
Paul Linseth, who served as Bruce's associate dean for his entire 16 years, recognized Bruce's educational and professional experience both in the military and the commercial segments set him up extremely well to grow the research arm of the university or of the, of the college. Bruce understood research. He also knew that we had to be collaborative in order to succeed at the federal level in bringing in research dollars. So when Embry-Riddle called uh, to see if we wanted to join a consortium, Paul, or Bruce actually answered the phone and looked into it, um, knowing that we needed to, to be collaborative with them. This led to the establishment of the FAA Center of Excellence for General Aviation Research, CIGAR. This is really what brought the aviation department into research, and many great things were accomplished that are still benefiting the aviation ecosystem today, from ADSB, our, flight our National General Aviation Flight Information Database, are truly leaders uh, in the industry. So amazing research was done not only within the aviation, but also other departments as well. In fact, over the 16 years Bruce was dean of the college, we brought in more than $140 million of externally funded research. Very impressive. I also learned that Bruce did invite the then president of Embry-Riddle during this time to visit North Dakota, where upon landing, the door of his aircraft was frozen shut, and it had to be pulled into a hangar, heated up for him to exit. <laughs> Right? Nowhere but North Dakota, right, Bruce, would that, uh, that happen? One of the most important roles of a college dean is fundraising. Ken Polovitz, Bruce's assistant dean, was quick to remark that Bruce excelled in this arena. He did an amazing job connecting with donors and making them fall in love with UND just as he was, even if they didn't have a prior connection to the University of North Dakota. Our scholarship endowments grew over this time, and even more impressively, so did our footprint, both at flight operations and here on campus, uh, to accommodate much needed growth for the program. In fact, we have Bruce and the Aerospace Foundation to thank for this beautiful building that we're in today. Robin Hall was built almost 100% on private dollars, and I honestly, I couldn't imagine where we would be as a college without this facility that brought in uh, helped us grow our UAS program, brought in eight active learning class classes, classrooms, numerous office space, and of course, great student gathering and event space like this. So thank you for this amazing facility. <clears throat> uh, lastly, Kent Loveless, a long-term aviation department chair, recognized the impact Bruce had on growing the academic mission of the college. Not only were new uh, undergraduate programs such as UAS, the first in the nation, started under his reign. He also made it a goal to add graduate programs in each of the academic departments. This commitment to academic uh, excellence was impressive. So I think we can all agree that Bruce was absolutely the perfect fit at the perfect time to lead UND Aerospace into the 21st century. So with that, it is my honor to welcome Dr. Bruce Smith into the UND Aerospace Hall of Fame Class of 2023. She didn't leave me with much to say. <laughs> I do have a story about Beth. I wasn't going to tell it, but not my golf. <laughs> no, nothing to do with your golf. Um, I was at a banquet, and I think it might have been an alumni banquet when Beth had just finished her school, and they introduced Beth as being a 4.0 student all the way through her entire college career. And, and the person who introduced her made a comment that was something like, "She never got a B while she was here." And at the time, I was sitting with Roger Thomas, who's the athletic director. He looked at me and he goes, I didn't get a B when I was at North Dakota either. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody knew what he meant. I mean, it was like. <laughs> so anyway, thank you, Beth and Dean Krause. Um, this event's always great because it allows you to get your family together. And that's hard to do. But my wife, Anne, is here with me. My sons, Alan and Jay, and my grandson, Logan, are here, and that's, that's very special for me. Our, our dear friends, Paul and Kathy Imel, are here. Kathy and Anna and I were high school classmates back in St. Louis Park, and that was one of the wonderful things about coming back to North Dakota, was that it gave us a chance to reunite with people that we knew from, from prior 
places, experiences, and you know, not only in, in uh, Minneapolis, but also here in North Dakota, to where we, we actually got to reunite, and that was very special for us as well. Um, Diane, Heather, Glenda, and Ann, um, Bob already mentioned it, but it's historic. You have all four of the first ladies of the Odegaard School here at one place. It, it, it's never happened before, it may never happen again. It, it's just absolutely amazing when you look at the history of the school. Sarah Garland, Sarah and I go all the way back to the days of football and she was a cheerleader. She truly was a cheerleader. <laughs> um, but, but what's special about Sarah is that Sarah was our political consultant when I came here in Washington, D.C. And over the first 10 years that I was the dean, we were, with her expertise and her help, we were able to garner $110 million in federal funding. And that was for air battle captain, helicopter training, West Point summer helicopter training, all the way up to the east-west runway that we enjoyed today. And it's hard not to be successful when you're getting $11 million a year from the federal government. So thank you, Sarah. And Pat, congratulations to you as well on an impressive career and, and the way that you've helped young people. And you'll see some of that throughout my presentation as well. That's, that's what we're all here for. And I have another story I have to tell you. Um, I recognize the other inductees, and, and Bob did recognize Gay and, and David as Sioux Award winners, but I have to tell you a story about David Williams. On a, on a very cold November wintry day, back in 1969, the offensive line coach made a decision to change all the blocking patterns in the offensive line. And it led to a day where uh, David Williamson rushed for 256 yards and set a rushing record that stood for 28 years. And uh, for both the university and for the North Central Conference. And I remember at that time I was the center and the offensive line coach uh, proposed a way for me to pull as the center, go outside the end and uh, cut off the middle linebacker's pursuit. And that's pretty common today, but it was never done then. And it was so much different that it helped to, to lead D Dave set that record. And I, all I remember is taking out the middle linebacker and seeing the back of his jersey going down the field. <laughs> and think about this. If you go back in the history of, U of UND football, in the first 100 years, he was the one that had more rushing yards than any other back in that, over that period of time in the history of North Dakota football. Amazing accomplishment. Um, Beth did call me and ask me what some of my special moments were. That was one of my special moments. I'm honored. I've always grown up as a team player. It's hard to accept a, an individual award when it really belongs to all the people who did the amazing work. And most of you, a lot of you are here today. Um, I've always said it was like being the conductor of the world's greatest symphony orchestra. All I had, everyone was a virtuoso in their own right, and all I had to do was raise the baton, and the music was gorgeous. It was beautiful. And I'll tell you a story about it. People ask me um, what it was like to lead the Odegaard School. And I tell a story about when my sons were growing up, and I was a hockey coach in youth leagues up in New York. And we were working on the B2 program at that time, and one of the people on the B2 program review team was a young captain who had played four years of varsity hockey at the Air Force Academy. And so one time there was in the winter, there was a time when the program review overlapped with one of my hockey games. So I asked him, I said, why don't you come down and watch, and uh, watch my team and then tell me if there's anything I can do that to uh, help from your expertise. And he came down. And my team won that night, nine to one. And he came over to the bench after the game and he said, Schmitty, don't tell him a thing, you might mess him up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it was like to run the Odegaard School. It's an amazing place. And um, when I talked to Beth on the phone, she asked me to cover the things that I, I had set up when I first came here. And when I was at the search committee in October of 1999, for the dean's position. I was asked about my vision for the Odegaard School, and I had four major goals. The first goal was to stay in the excellence of the aviation program, and I've always told everyone that we train young men and women to fly as professional pilots better than anyone else in the world, 
and that's you know Tim what you've you've done as well is your whole career has been set to train young men and women to be professional pilots as well as anyone in the world my second goal was to strengthen the academic side and Beth did talk about that um, when I arrived in 2000 the Odegaard school had four major departments and only three offered master's degrees within the next seven years there were five departments all offered masters and PhD programs and we had our first PhD graduate now seven years sounds like a long time but when you consider the glacial pace of academia that was light speed <laughs> and again which is really a compliment to the faculty not, not to me um, and strengthening in degree programs as Beth had mentioned brought research and cigar was it was probably the best example we had young faculty members and they were they were great at writing they were great at doing research but the hardest part for a young faculty member is to get funding and cigar was the thing that that brought the funding and, and allow their young faculty members to pursue their doctorates and tenure and and uh, pursue their careers so it was an enabler for the for the uh, program and Paul Linseth really spared that so we spearheaded it so I'm really glad that we had that and you can see the results the third goal was to place more emphasis on the myriad of careers in aerospace other than commercial aviation now our emphasis would still be big big airplane left seat major airline but I had a great career experience in one of the other 95% of the career opportunities in aerospace and when you look around today you can see the results of that and I talked to Bob earlier in the week and he talked about the aviation management program splitting into tracks so they would also have con um, controllers and dispatchers and sure not big airplane big and big airline but but a, certainly a, w a welcome and a rewarding career for young men and women to begin and that that's what it's all about now the success we enjoyed while I was here was major majorly done excuse me done to three major factors the first part of our success and certainly the most important the people were great they knew their jobs they worked hard they embraced empowerment the second factor was attributable to my experience in industry I understood the revenue side of the equation we couldn't we could do things no one else could do because we had money and the aerospace foundation certainly was a, a contr major contributor to that the third factor was the spirit of John Odegaard John was always known as a visionary and I wish I could have been more like him I wasn't a visionary I was an opportunist the unmanned aircraft systems program the resurgence of the international training programs were a result of pop-up phone calls at least I had the sense to say yes um, I'd also like to take credit for the addition of the Hilton Garden Inn and Robin Hall but those are John's visions as well at least it led to Diane Odegaard to say one of the nicest things anyone could say would say to me which was we made John's dreams come true now I left John's dream of a monorail to the airport up to Bob <laughs> <laughs> earlier I mentioned a fourth goal and this one was personal throughout my career I worked for some wonderful people and I also had bosses who were terrible so much so that I dreaded going to work in the morning and I made a pledge to myself that if I ever had the opportunity to lead an organization I would create a work environment where people were excited about their jobs and enjoyed coming to work I tried to emulate the best tra traits of the good leaders and avoid the worst of the worst um, hopefully I was able to do that in closing I'd like to say thank you to everyone who made this possible I'm eternally grateful for having the opportunity to lead the greatest aerospace college in the world thank you <laughs> And so with that, I, I conclude our ceremony this year. So congratulations to both Pat and to Bruce. Thank you for, to them for all they've done for us, for our students, for all of aviation and aerospace in general. And then thanks to their family and friends and everyone else that's here with us today. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day.